Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always my co-host, Nick Bellato. Tonight we're taking a break from what we usually do, though we will be doing, in addition to this, what we usually do, which is the film breakdowns for the Giants offense and the defense. Defense may end up coming tomorrow. We haven't decided yet. Uh, it's a timing constraint issue. We'll see what happens there. But we also wanted to get in some reaction to the Joe Shane press conference from today, the bye week press conference, as well as Brian Dable, who spoke a little bit more, I would say, forthcoming in his press conference than he usually does. Gave a little bit more information, a lot more information than he typically usually does in his press conferences. Maybe that's also because he felt like it's time on the bye week. Bye week is a little break in the action for the Giants and a way to reassess where they're at. So the main headline that people have grabbed, Nick, is Joe Shane saying the expectation is when Daniel Jones is healthy, he will be our starting quarterback. Again, he says we don't have a crystal ball in terms of how the rehab is going to go. Different patients respond differently to these surgeries. And then whether there's going to be swelling in the knee or any setbacks, nobody has a crystal ball on this, but the expectation moving forward that he will be our starting quarterback. Now, he also said in related to that, no, it doesn't mean that we won't draft a quarterback this offseason he says i think we're gonna have to do something at quarterback whether it's free agency of the draft just where we are quarterback tyrod taylor's contract is up devito is obviously under contract and daniel we don't know when he's going to be ready so just from an offseason program standpoint i think that'll be a position we have to look at there's different avenues free agency of the draft but we'll have to address it at some point so any thoughts on that nick to me it comes off at least my first reaction is what else was he supposed to say? Is he really going to sit here and say, I was disappointed in Daniel this year? Yeah, he's under contract no matter what. I'm disappointed in Daniel. He's not our starting quarterback. We're looking for a new starting quarterback. Like, what does he gain by doing that? So to me, that part of it is a little bit overblown so far by fan reaction. 100%. What the hell do you expect him to say? They just gave this guy a $40 million a year contract. What is he going to be like? You know what? No, that was a mistake, even though it was less than a year ago. Let's ship him out of town now that he's rehabbing a torn ACL. No, this was exactly what Joe Shane was going to say. If the Giants somehow end up with a top three pick or a top two pick, that still is in the realm of possibility. The Giants have a really good grade on either Caleb Williams or Drake May. They're going to go in that direction. I trust Joe Shane to go in that direction. I would imagine that's where his head is at. He's not going to say that to the media, though. Come on now. No, no way. And I think also, you know, the fact of the matter is they push back so much of that Daniel Jones contract from a cap standpoint that there's no way to, they, they cannot physically move on from him next year. I mean, you could theoretically trade him, but, you know, outside of Giants fans in the bubble, no one else in the NFL is taking on that contract right now. No one will be trading for Daniel Jones contract unless you give them draft picks to do so. You could offer, you know, like a Brock Osweiler type deal where you give up draft picks and Daniel Jones just to get rid of the contract. But even in that scenario, I doubt it. I know people have fan fiction, the Falcons and things like that. But I mean, God bless anyone who would be taking this contract at this point for a guy coming off a torn ACL, multiple major neck injuries, making 40 million plus per year as a contract. And, you know, has that, you know, outside of the bubble note, we have no proof that anyone really believes that he can be a franchise quarterback outside of the Giants who have made him that contract offer. So I would rule out a trade. And so he will be on the team next year. It's just a matter of will he be the starter or not? And Joe Shane said the expectation is that he will be the starter. But like you said, Nick. What is he going to say? You know, he doesn't have the number one overall pick. If this was the end of the season, Nick, and he said that, and the Giants held the number one overall pick, that might be worth considering, right? Even then, though, I feel like he would say that. He would have to say that. The only time we would really know is draft night. You know, he's going to hold his cards close to the vest. He did it with Gabe on Thibodeau. The, all the Charles Cross smoke that was out there as well. <laughs> you can consider that. There's a lot of smoke that he's put out there. And I've heard someone even suggest, uh, shout out Big Dash, I believe it was him, suggest that, you know, this whole wink Martindale Dable thing is purposely leaked by Joe Shane to kind of figure out who their leaks are within the organization. You know, maybe a whole Tyrion Lannister. It is a Tyrion Lannister. Yeah. It might be even like a Tywin Lannister, to be completely honest with you. I don't know who I respect more out of those two. They were both G's, OGs. And so, and I like the Game of Thrones reference. So I don't expect much, but I did think he did answer something interesting, Nick, that I wanted to go over with you about adding a potential quarterback. Because like I said earlier, he said, look, we don't have Taylor under contract. Vito's under contract, yes, but we will probably look to add another quarterback. And that makes sense, right? Jones coming off the injury. DeVito playing well right now, but still probably not just going to go into a year if Jones is not ready for week one with, hey, let's just have Tommy there. So he said, there's always a lot of risk in drafting and adding quarterbacks, he said. Look at the past 
however many years of top 10 quarterbacks drafted. I just went through the 2018 draft and how many of those guys are starters? How many of the guys are with different teams? He says some are out of the league that were taken in the first round from that draft. So he said, it's not a position you can just evaluate on film. I don't believe. And this Nick is something we always talk about, which <laughs> yeah. unfortunately for me and you, Nick, as we go through our off season, we're going to have our film takeaways and it's going to be incomplete and we might get screwed because of it. AKA Josh Rosen, who was good on tape, horrible off tape. And that's just the nature of the business, right? Like we can only work with what we have as analysts and we don't have what he has. I also think Daniel Jones aces all that off the field stuff. Oh yeah. First guy in last, like all of the coaching cliches, all of them Daniel Jones has in his arsenal. And I think it's one reason why this new regime, or now I call them new, they've been here for a little bit, why this regime is so endeared towards them. Yeah. And there's also proof of that based on what Joe Shane has said in the past and what he should said today, which I'll get to in a moment, just to, you know, call back what Nick just said. But he said, there's always risk. And he talked about that 2018 draft somewhere out of the league. He said, it's not a position you can just evaluate on tape. I, be- I don't believe he said, you got to get with these kids. You got to meet with them. You got to get around them. You got to put them on the board. Everyone always talks about this, put them on the board. Nick and I will never be able to put any of these <laughs> quarterback prospects on the board. So we are kind of screwed. Damn that. shame. It is. Cause it would be a lot of fun to see what these guys can do. And just for those who don't know, cause we've referenced in the past, when we say put them on the board, that means, you know, put them in front of basically a whiteboard where they can, essentially, I'm sure they do this. Uh, electronically nowadays. I don't really know for sure, but that's kind of like the lingo of it. And they can kind of see where they're at from a processing standpoint. Now, even in that, they still can't really evaluate, in my opinion, how they process when the bullets fly. And we'll get to a little bit more info on that as far as mental processing post-snap goes. We discussed Brian Dable's comments today on Tommy DeVito, which were interesting, but just keep that in mind. And he says, can they learn? Can they process information? You've got to talk to the people. He says, especially in this market. That's a really interesting thing. He says, bringing a quarterback into this New York market, I mean, it's not for everybody. Not everybody can handle it, Nick. He says, but again, it could be a free agent, whatever. We're going to have to address it at some point. We have a UFA here. And then he just kind of goes on and on and about what we already just said about what they have already. But I thought the, the first part of that quote was really interesting. Nick, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Dan, it's nothing new. We know playing in New York is a lot different. We've seen a lot of athletes in many different sports come into the city and absolutely flounder, go into other cities like the Arizona market and flourish out there. So I would imagine any general manager of a New York team needs to get to know the mental toughness if that's the word you want to use to to phrase it of that specific athlete coming in it was also interesting dan to see joe shane asked about the uh (laughs) the quarterbacks in this upcoming class and he was like oh yeah i've evaluated uh everyone the entire class not just the quarterback position it's like yeah you just so happen to be at a bunch of unc games you just so happen to be at the michigan game you just so happen to be and yeah i get it look he's not going to say yeah i'm evaluating the quarterbacks but let's be honest here like he is going to look long and hard (laughs) phrasing into the quarterback position this year as he should what's going on big blue banter listeners i'm excited for the football season for several reasons and one of those reasons is prize picks which is north america's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform and it's so simple to use Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. Make Little Caesars, the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, part of your game day. There are few things better in the world than kicking back, watching some football, and biting into some delicious Little Caesars pizza. 
order online during our pizza pizza pregame one hour before and three hours after NFL kickoffs plus all day on Sunday and get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Old world pepperoni, pepperoni, extra cheese, Italian sausage, olives, onions, pineapple if you're into that put it on half the pie the entire pie there are so many other options that i don't have time to name slap that on a round crust a thin crust a stuffed crust a detroit style deep dish either way you win and speaking of winning everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza portal pickup So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the game. This holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all your holiday to-dos. This November, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered straight to your door, ready in just two minutes. No prep, no mess, easy to go, very convenient, ultra tasty. Head to factormeals.com slash bigbluebanter50 and use code bigbluebanter50 to get 50% off. That's code bigbluebanter50, all one word, at factormeals.com slash bigbluebanter50 and you get your 50% off. Yeah, as he should. And they asked him also, Nick, which I thought was interesting. Why? It's just like a blunt question. Why do you still believe in Daniel? How would you answer that? He says, I mean, I've seen it. You guys all saw it last season. They won 10 games. Or he said the guy won 10 games. He won a road playoff game for the Giants. Now, I'll pause right there, Nick, because I feel like there's a little bit of inconsistency in this answer. He says, I've seen it. You've seen it. The guy won 10 games. They won a road game. But then earlier in the answer, when they asked earlier in the presser, Nick, when they asked Joe Shane, like, what happened with Daniel the first five games? Why was he so, you know, they didn't say why I was so bad on tape, but that's the reality. He was like, no, it's a team game. It's 11 players. It takes all these guys. You can't just put it all on the quarterback. Quarterback's important, but you can't just put it all. That's pretty inconsistent to me when he goes, the guy won 10 games, he won a road playoff game. So now you're giving him all the credit for the win. But then in the fact, before this, you're kind of taking away all the blame for how he played. And I just wish I heard more than this personally. Like he goes, yeah, he won 10 games. You saw on the priest. He goes, you guys saw the preseason. Like, sorry, Joe, I'm not going to put anything on the preseason. The dude had a good drive in his one preseason game. Who gives a shit? The defense didn't play anything. They didn't run any scheme. It meant nothing. It was all quick hitting shit. I mean, come on with that. Like that part just bothered me a little bit. He says, I think we got punched in those early on. We dug ourselves in a hole, blah, blah, blah. Weren't able to get out of it. We're trying now, but we still believe in Daniel, the person. That part was also a little weird to me that we still believe in Daniel, the person. I just wish, Nick, I could hear a little bit, though, about more. I want more, Nick. Like, and this is what I put on Twitter today. It's the one part that bothered me about the press. And I don't, it doesn't bother me to a large extent, Nick, because I know he's not going to say shit to the media. It just is what it is. But like, a great question would have been Tommy DeVito has an 11% explosive pass rate this year. Daniel Jones had a 6% explosive pass rate. Daniel Jones was bottom of the league. Tommy DeVito was top of the league in that rate. Why is that? Why have we, why have we, why did we watch Tommy DeVito yeah. throw a whole shot against cover two? And I basically can't remember a single time Daniel Jones has done that in five years. I'm sure the fact checkers will be like, he did it one time in 2020 <laughs> week 13. He threw a whole shot. That shows how off you are that you'd even look to find that. Obviously, I don't mean once. I mean, can we see this 20, 25 times, not once, twice, three times on film in five years? And I'd love to ask him about Daniel Jones, the passer, Daniel Jones, the quarterback, what he puts on tape, what he puts on the field, the processing, all of the things we discussed, Dick, not just the he's a leader. He won 10 games. He won a playoff game. When earlier in the presser, you tell us that it's not all his fault. The first five games, it's not all on the quarterback. It takes 11 guys. It just doesn't, that part of it just, it, it's just not consistent to me a little bit. I see where you're coming from. I was yeah. not bothered by that at all. I don't know what else Joe Shane is going to say. Everyone okay, knows. Back. Let me, let me just stop. I'm not bothered by it. That's a stupid thing to say. I take that back. I was not okay. bothered by it. I just found it a little inconsistent. Let me just say that. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's fair. I'll say this and I'm not trying to stick up for, for Joe Shane per se. He knows the narrative around Daniel Jones. He knows the narrative around that contract. He has to True. stick up for that investment. And I think he entered that frame of those questions with that in mind, saying like, look, he has done it before. 
And it's not all on him that the Giants collapsed this year. And I think he has a point there. It's not all on Daniel Jones. And it's we not. Have not but it's also not that. all him that they won that playoff game. I know, but but he's also coming at it from we've seen this quarterback lead us to victory before. Yeah. He can do that. So that's kind of how he is um delivering that message in from my understanding. Sure. I, I don't I don't see um see much wrong with that delivery from from Joe Shane. I'll oh, no. Yeah, it's not I I, I guess I, I let me rephrase it, Nick. It's not that I yeah. find it wrong from Shane or even inconsistent. I want to take that back. I don't find it inconsistent. Let me take that back. It's not inconsistency from Shane that I'm thinking about here. I just think more so it's just kind of pointless father. I'll tell you why. Jimmy Garoppolo won games with the 49ers. He took him to a conference championship game. Then he took him to a Super Bowl. Does anyone want Jimmy Garoppolo right now? No, no because Jimmy Garoppolo led them to wins, but did he really lead them to wins? And Daniel Jones did a lot more, in my opinion, than Jimmy Garoppolo ever last year for the Giants than Jimmy Garoppolo ever did. That's how low I am on Jimmy G. But it just goes to the whole quarterback wins thing. It's like, yeah, if a guy's throwing, like, you know, it's just, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. And Daniel Jones pretty much did. I think Daniel Jones could have been argued as one of the best players in that Vikings game. There's no doubt about it. But when the when you consider the context, which is one, it's the worst defense maybe fielded from a coordinator standpoint, scheme standpoint in NFL history, the Donatel Vikings, and then two, he shit the bed completely against the Eagles the next week. It does kind of walk it back a little bit for me. Yeah, the talent gap obviously between the Eagles and the Giants is a huge thing, and I think that's another takeaway. From this, and I wish there was a question asked. I didn't hear a question yes. asked about this because we went into the season like, "Hey, is the gap closed?" And the Giants were like, "Oh, maybe, you know, we kind of closed." But no, obviously the gap wasn't even close to being closed. And and uh, I think the punched in the nose is a is an apt way to describe exactly what happened. Losing forty to nothing against a divisional rival when the entire offseason we built up the New York Giants, the media, everybody involved with the New York Giants built up how the Giants have kind of revamped their team. It's embarrassing, frankly. And also losing Andrew Thomas on the first drive. I know that was brought up. Like, why have, Why does your offensive line suck, Joe? You said you had depth, Joe. And he's just like, well, losing your star left tackle on the first drive of the season is going to affect you. Has a good point. I'll also say, I think Joe Shane has, I don't know if this managed is fair, Dan, and I want to get your take on this. I think, and dude, I don't want to sound like a broken record. I just think he took calculated risks. Like, yeah, Josh Azuda can play left tackle. You sure about yeah. that? You sure about that? Ben Bredesen, he could play center. By the way, I, I don't, I've never watched that show. And I find that guy to be very annoying, almost um, like the, the um, annoying, like the guy from um, Workaholics, the small guy, Adam Devine. Do you know what you I'm talking about? Wait, first of all, I, I, I will start by saying I love Adam Devine. So we're not on the same page there. Okay. Um, I figured this is an unpopular take of mine. Okay. So what was I, the I, other guy talking about? It, I don't even know the name of it. It's on Netflix and he's, he's memed all over the place and he has a bunch of gifts. I don't call. Oh, you're talking about Tim Robinson. I guess. I don't know. He's wait, annoying. He seems annoying I, to me. Oh no. Oh wait. Did I, the one I showed you the episodes of and you didn't laugh, no one laughed at all. And I told you this is hit or miss comedy. Is it that one sketch comedy? I, I think you should leave. Remember I showed you guys some episodes, you and Don and a couple other people. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> laughed. No one found it funny, but me. And, so I, and, so I honestly, yeah. I didn't remember that, that interaction between us. I'm just okay. going off of his blow up right I have now. To show you on I have to show you a picture to know. His no, no, no. You're, you're, it is Tim Robinson. Like I recognize the name. Tim Robinson. Yes. Yeah. I find it very annoying. I, like, if and I again, I've never watched, never watched the show. I'm basing this. I did watch purely. the show. I showed you an episode. No. Yeah. But, but like, I don't remember it because it okay. was really bad. And I'm sure there were other yeah. things involved <laughs> to uh, alter my memory a little bit. But uh, yes, it's this guy. I just, I don't know. I just seeing the gifs of him or gifs. Now I'm calling him gifs. Well, seems he's very heavily, annoying to me. heavily gifted and memed heavily gifted and memed yeah but regardless of the fact we should probably get back to the to the new york <laughs> to the new york yeah. giant here um yeah joe shane did not have the proper depth along the offensive line you took those calculated risks you thought you had them you did not have them and they blew up in your face and losing andrew thomas is a valid excuse as to why your offensive line sucks right now or why it did suck when he was out but it's not the whole story and that's one thing that he deserves credit for. And he showed some contrition, possibly I could even say compunction with um, certain roster roster uh, decisions with the Eric Gray one. Someone asked yeah. a really good question about right. Eric Gray. It's like, hey, you put him in a position that might not have, you know, maximized this kid's skill set. And he was like, hey, that one's on me, you know. And then he kind of danced around it and talked. And he's like, hey, but now we have Gunnar Olszewski. He's doing pretty good. And it's like, yeah, but the one thing he brought up that was really interesting, he's like, look, we wanted to keep Jamison Crowder. Or he didn't say this, but he talked about Jamison Crowder and then said, look, we already had seven wide receivers. We can't keep eight. Who are we going to cut? And I'm sitting here thinking, 
Sterling Shepard, and I hate to say it, but Sterling Shepard's on this roster, and, and there really wasn't a role for him. He's purely here just because he is a veteran leader, which there is a lot of merit to that. But we saw throughout this season, not having a true punt returner bit the Giants in the ass. Right. And if you are saying, well, what's the expendable spot at the wide receiver position? There's an easy answer there. And I hate to say it, but it's three. You're talking about Sterling Shepard, of course. Yeah. And I, it's something I understand um, for sure. And you've brought this up a bunch, Nick. I have a special place in my heart for Sterling Ooh, Shepard. Man, so it's harder for me. And I know you have that too. It's just, it's harder for me, especially, you know, when I see that. When he is on the field, I still think he's effective. I still think he runs good routes. The touchdown he had versus Vegas was filthy. You feel like you can use that somewhere. But I understand at this point why a lot of fans have turned the page and also why it's fair to question, like, do you need that guy in your roster? Could you use somebody who could actually be a returner or somebody who can help you in other ways? So I totally understand that. I have one more thing I wanted to bring up. Or you know what? Let me get we'll get we'll circle back to that. I want to talk about something very important, I think, to me maybe not as important to some Giants fans who have already turned the page, though I find that to be very premature in the sense for multitude of reasons, but it's Evan Neal. And they asked Joe Shane about Evan Neal and they asked him, could you consider moving him to guard? And Joe Shane basically shot that down immediately. He's like, look, I'm not, I don't believe in that. And they're like, go ahead. I wouldn't say he shot it down immediately. And that was asked by the one of the only Ed Valentine, my boss over there at big blue view. And you might have the quote in front of you, but he yeah, said, you know, but it was more so along uh, the lines of like, you know, I don't think so, but it wasn't like, absolutely not. He's our right tackle of the future. It was more like, I don't think so. You know, Evan, we went back to his Alabama tape. He brought up and, and we right. uh, I went back. I evaluated his Alabama tape. We just need to get him to play at that level consistently. Cause that's just not what he's doing right now. And you can maybe read into that, read into all the offensive line coach questions and all of that. Maybe that's looking into it a little bit, but we know that's a big talking point on Twitter, Bobby Johnson, but it was more so not right now. I'm not fully ruling it out, especially if Evan Neal does come back, which isn't a certainty. According to Brian Dable, he said he doesn't know. I would imagine yeah. he does, but I'm not a freaking doctor. What the hell do yeah. I know? So if he does come back and still sucks at right tackle, I think the Giants at least explore it and have a real conversation about moving him to guard. Yeah, I mean, look, it's interesting if he struggles again. I do feel like Joe Shane was leaning on that tape, though, at Bama, though. He's just like, look, the tape is the tape at Bama. He needs I'll I've got the exact quote here. Let me find yeah, it again. Let's do it. Um, Let's see this. So he said with Evan Neal, I don't think uh, he said, Evan Neal, are you at the point of a second year where you need to think about whether he's tackling guard? He said, no, I don't think so. I went back and watched the Alabama stuff. The kid can play. We just got to get him to be more consistent. Like I've had, like I've got a lot of confidence in that ed and Evan, he's a hard worker. It's killing him right now to be out there. He's missing some valuable reps in year two, but as soon as he's healthy, he's scratching, clawing to get back. We're looking forward to getting him back out there, but he knows there's some things he can do better. Uh, and that's what we expect from him. And he, that was the second time he had another quote on him where he mentioned essentially Evan had a really good camp. The concussion missed some weeks, came back, but he needs to play better. He said three times he needs, he said, Evan needs to play better. He knows yeah. that. So he did, you know, put out there like to the media and to everybody. I'm not just sugarcoating this. You know, he, he beat around the bush with a lot of players, not with Evan Neal. He said he needs to play better. No, and I think yeah, he's spot on. I mean, what else are you going to say, though? This is a top 10 pick. Right. And he has not looked like it. And according to a lot of my buddies, I guess, who cover Carolina, Iki Aquano hasn't looked all that, that great either. Charles Cross has, has been good, but he's dealt with some Injury. injuries. So there are other tackles who, who have played well. But I watched that Alabama. Uh, you had Abraham Lucas, who also went to Washington. Nice you had was Max, Max Mitchell as well, who Penning ended up going to the Jets. Penning but I think they're... I'm sorry. Uh, Penning wasn't in that draft, right? He was the one before, maybe Trevor Penning. Either way, Trevor Penning. I think he was the one before, but he was not good. Oh, he's been. Yeah, we knew he did that. <laughs> that was obvious. That was not a question. That that was one of those like old offensive line coaches just wanted him yeah. because at the senior bowl he was taking yeah, like, he was just looks like a badass. Or just yeah, on fire. Was like yeah. then you turn on the tape, you're like, what the hell? So you couldn't <laughs> and again, like you turn on Colton Miller's tape at UCLA and you're like, what the hell? And now he's great. So I mean it's so freaking hard to project these things. A couple things I want to bring up before we get out of here. One thing about yeah. Joe Shane, he was asked if there's one thing that you have learned through losing. What is it? And he said, I need to have a better poker face. Now, poker references aside, because I know you're a degenerate. What did you think of that? Do you think like Joe Shane is walking around the, the front office just moping and shit? The <laughs> uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't really know what he meant by that. I heard that, too. I thought that was interesting as well. I wasn't really sure what he meant by that, like around the facility or to us in the media or I don't know exactly. 
Yeah, that's one thing. And maybe it is testing the media. And we've said this before. Joe Sheen gives us a little bit more than Brian Dable gives us. Brian Dable yeah. doesn't give the media anything. Mike, that. Yeah, t- today you, you did get a little bit. He was getting pressed pretty hard on the Wink Martindale stuff, which we Wait. can talk about. But he essentially is just turning the page, which might be the best thing to do. But the one thing Brian Dable did say before the press conference with Joe Shane, he said, it's a competitive sport. And I was kind of wondering why exactly did he bring that up? Maybe it's because the media was giving him crap about Wink Mar- yelling at Wink Martindale. And I've just seen a lot of people on the beat and other people I respect around Giants Twitter opine on this situation. And I'm just like, I really don't know at all what's going on with this Wink Martindale situation. But regardless of the fact, we're heading into a bye week that could quell questions for maybe about seven days. And then they're going to pop back up. They're going to pop back up. I think, you know, if we want to get into that, there were some interesting comments Brian Dable made about Tommy DeVito. We can get into that. But I also want to talk about something Dan Duggan brought up real quick, Nick, because it was interesting, a connection he make he made. And he said, it's got to be at least interesting. And I didn't even really think about this, by the way, Nick, until Duggan brought it up. He says, it's got to be at least interesting that Joe Shane just told us to the media and admitted it, and not just admitted it, but actually did it, that he said he re- recently reviewed the 2018 quarterback class. Like, why would he be doing that if he's not? looking into quarterbacks, right? Like your point. point of reviewing a 2018 quarterback class, unless you're looking for information on quarterbacks in general. And then he went on to say like, look, some of these guys are on NFL, NFL. They didn't work. Maybe he's looking as to, into why they didn't work. He obviously got his guy in 2018, Josh Allen, and that's who they made the move to trade up for. But you know, that was also one of those drafts where, and as, as Duggan said, it was the only draft in the last 74 years where four quarterbacks were picked in the top 10. Maybe, He's looking at similarities where this could be a class as well, where four quarterbacks are drafted inside the top 10. I don't know. Shane was the assistant GM at the time with Brandon Bean in Buffalo when they did trade up for Josh Allen. That's the thing. They traded up for Josh Allen, the seventh overall in that draft. Um, Just something to consider there. Like if Joe Shane is looking into this class more deeply than we, than we would think. And if he also is willing to trade up. I think he's definitely willing to trade up. And I think he's certainly considering this as well. This is not a surprise. You need to win in the in this league. If if the Giants rolled Daniel Jones coming off of an ACL injury out there when they had an opportunity to get another quarterback and Daniel Jones doesn't work out, like these guys are going to be out of a job. It's that quick. You need to look, they they already tied the money up in Daniel Jones. You could say that they kind of were were forced to do so because of the situation, but you need to find your franchise quarterback and play the way the Giants played earlier in the season. It, it doesn't really inspire that Daniel Jones is that guy. And now I know Joe Shane is somewhat stuck up for Daniel Jones. It's not all on Daniel Jones. It's not all on Daniel Jones, but you still need to find that guy to grow and develop. And I think Brian Dable is exactly that guy as he kind of talked about, because I like listening to Brian Dable when, when he was discussing Tommy DeVito and yes. Tommy DeVito's ability to articulate what he sees on the football field. I love how he brought that up. And he's like, this is a skill set that some veteran quarterbacks don't necessarily have. They can't tell you what they saw. Like Tommy DeVito comes up. He's like, Hey, I saw that safety drop down. He was at 12 right. yards, but I knew I could squeeze it to the back. So he's like saying stuff like this, is an undrafted kid. That's that speaks volumes about Tommy DeVito. And also I just appreciate having a coach that I know can develop a quarterback because he's developed some of the best quarterbacks in the league, specifically Josh Allen. It's not even just that he's developed Josh Allen, who we already talked about moved multiple times yeah. in case anyone who hasn't heard our podcast, because it's an incredibly important point. He basically taught Allen how to see the game in different in a different way and really changed who he was. If you remember back, Josh Allen at Wyoming was not a good quarterback. If we evaluated the tape, Nick, and then we were like gung ho on traits, Nick, and we were telling Giants fans, like if we had a crystal ball back in 2018, and I we wouldn't because I was wrong on Allen. I based it on the tape and I didn't like Allen at all. I don't know where you were at or if you, if you evaluated him at the time, Nick, cause we weren't working together on this pod, but you know, if we had sat there in 2018 and said, gung ho giant should draft Josh Allen at number two overall at the time, we would have been flamed by our listeners flame. They would have been like, are you kidding me? This guy yeah. threw for 58% completion rate in college at Wyoming. Have you seen the tape? This guy can't throw the front side of a barn. And yet in the end, none of what he did in college on tape actually mattered because quarterback is a projection position. And he projected really well to the NFL. And then it's not just that the story doesn't end there. Then he met with Brian Dable. Brian Dable helped him become who he was, as did everyone on that team, including Bean and Shane, who helped build the roster around him for what it was, make the trade for Stefan Diggs. All of those things played factors for sure. But it's just interesting to me to think about just like what will go into their projection at quarterback, because we know it's not just going to be Joe Shane told us, hey, it ain't just going to be the film. Okay. It's going to most, not mostly, but it's going to be a lot of, 
what happens when we meet with these guys? What happens when we put them in front yeah. of the board? So just something to think about there. Exactly. I wanted to get your opinion one, real quick, though. And uh, well, just on the Josh Allen front, I wasn't gung ho about drafting Josh. Allen. I watched the tape of Josh Allen. I watched that Iowa game in week one of his was that oh, senior season. And I was like, oh, my oh, God. My and then God. I saw him down at the senior bowl. And I was like, this guy is, is so erratic. Like I bought into the arm strength and things, but I was like, yeah. this is a top 10 pick. I don't know. And this is one of the reasons why I evaluate. And I know you brought this up in the past, why I evaluate quarterbacks a little bit differently. Now, I didn't do a deep dive into Josh Allen. I didn't do a deep dive into Patrick Mahomes, but I acknowledged their physical gifts. And now I put more stock in those physical yes. gifts. If you have someone you trust in developing quarterbacks, which right now we do, we didn't have that with Joe judge. And we knew that at the time we weren't like, Hey, Jason Garrett, man, he's a quarterback. What? No, we knew Jason Garrett sucked as a coordinator. All right. Like, well, like we, we did. And we talked about it basically since the giants hired him. We were like, maybe he can, you know, adapt. And he never adapted. No. <laughs> He didn't adapt, but uh, going back to, to Josh Allen, yeah, I would not have been gung-ho about that. But right now, if there's a prospect similar to him, like let's say Anthony Richardson last year, I remember I texted you, I think it was in like December or November. I was like, Anthony Richardson's going top 10. Yep. There's no way, like they were like, yeah, this guy might be like a day three pick. I was like, that's the stupidest yeah. thing I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> The most life. athletic quarterback in the history yeah. of the combine with the arm talent to make a throw to every th spot of the field is never going in round three. It's just not yeah. happening. Anymore. And people might not have known that he would, was yeah the most right. athletic that was back in november but it was just like someone of that size who can run the mat in the manner that he did he's definitely gonna end and up going bro. So yeah, throw it, exactly. this year. phenomenal phenomenal yeah, no. uh, I, li I like richardson hopefully he can heal from that shoulder injury one yeah. thing before we get out of here though brother what were your thoughts on the, the trading part of the joe shane press conference i felt like there were some good questions pressing joe shane a little bit with some inconsistencies about how he shopped leonard williams and how it and then I think Joe Shane actually did a good job defending himself. And I, I understood where Joe Shane was coming, where he was like, hey, this is a human business. This isn't fantasy football. You can't just pick people up and drop them. I wanted to kind of pass it through Leonard Williams to see how he would react. But it's also, I think it was Art Stapleton. Don't, don't quote me on that. I think it was Art who was like, but at the same time, the second round pick was on the line. If Leonard just didn't want to get traded, were you not going to take the second round pick? And I'm like, oh, that's good. But I want to, I want to throw that to you. And then I want to ask you about the Saquon Barkley part of this and how the Giants just didn't even take any question what that means moving forward on Saquon. Right. Yeah. As far as both sides go, I mean, from Leonard Williams standpoint, he basically said, I thought I, from what I gathered, he said, it's not, it's going to be different for each player in each situation, obviously. And he kind of beat around the bush. I feel like he didn't give full details on look, if Leonard had said no, what would have happened? I kind of think Nick, he was gun traded no matter what. And the end, Joe Shane would have been like, nah, man, I'm not going to pass up this second round pick. I mean, look at it now. I just made a tweet about this today, Nick. The Seahawks are six and five. Gino's obviously playing hurt. He does not look like I felt like he had no drive on his passes the other night. Watching him throw those outs, dude, it was painful to see. Um, and they're six and five with games against the Eagles. I put it out on Twitter today. I'm forgetting now. It's the Eagles, the 49ers, twice, and one more, or two, two 49ers, and maybe one more. And Dallas, dude, well, at I think Dallas. They played 49ers, didn't they, on Thanksgiving? Yeah, they played 49ers. Yeah. One more 49ers at Dallas and Eagles. I mean, they could realistically lose all three of those and maybe another and get to eight or nine losses. We could be very well looking at a top 50 pick from that trade for Leonard Williams. Just an absolute miracle in my mind because I've seen so many, not so many, but the last Giants GM was just the total opposite in this. How many countless, I mean, every season, at, no, not, not how many, every single season under that GM, the Giants were shit by the midpoint and they weren't even in real playoff contention. Don't you dare talk to me about the year the Eagles tanked. Oh, wow, six or seven win division. They don't give a fuck about that. They weren't going oh. here. Sorry for the curse. Um, but, you know, and Gettleman never did that. The one time he had an opportunity, he did the opposite. He traded for a guy. And Joe Shane, in this first opportunity to do it, did make this trade. I love Leonard Williams. He's a great player, man. But I sure as hell would be pissed right now if we had still had him had him on the roster at 4-8, and eight, an impending free agent, instead of that second-round pick that could very well now be top 50, maybe even like 44 overall. This is like legit. That's where you get like the, the Antoine Winfields of the world and like, Difference making players depending on the, the position. Wandale Robinsons. For. Yeah, Wando. Yeah, great. And like the George Pickens of the world. Like this is where you can get like the hey, uber down players. No, no Wando Robinson disrespect. No, no, and, no. No, I know that. But I'm just saying, like, dude, I watching that game and I can't wait to get into the all 22. This dude is blocking 290 pound dudes and like coming off of it and actually being effective, awesome. allowing Andrew Thomas to transition onto the block. I have so much respect for Wando Robinson and I'm excited about his future. And I think the um 
I think the Seahawks, or at least Chris Collinsworth, or it might have been Chris, I don't know, whoever did the game on Thanksgiving said that they the Seahawks traded for Leonard Williams in part because of how he played against the 49ers in week three. Right. And that would piss me off if I'm a Seahawk. It's like, yeah, that's great and everything. And I get it. You're, you're, you know, you're swinging. But now that it's not working out, you look back on it and you're like, we gave up a second round pick. But I also heard that dude. And I, I'm trying to remember back in my memory because it was very weird. I thought that was one of his worst games. I know Arizona was horrible. Did he bounce back right away after Arizona? <laughs> I he might have. So it was he a did Thursday. have that air on fire game. Yeah, he did play much better against San Fran. It's like a kind of rebound from that weird Arizona game. And, and with it not working out, do you think John Schneider, the general manager of the Seattle Dude, Seahawks, is just all the time is just going to start developing like a New England accent and just start oh. to shrink a little bit? sit at his computer well, desk with give credit, like the difference is I, I like what you're saying and john schneider has had so many misses like the jamal adams trade was beyond pathetic multiple bad injury he, too that bad injury, really injury affected, but like that was yeah. never gonna work out this dude is not like you, tra- you if you're gonna do that trade it better be ed reed ball hawk not jamal adams come up to the box type of safety who can't really do anything in coverage but also, like he's taken a million tackles that didn't work out in the first round, the linebacker, all the things he's done. But then again, he also did make the Russell Wilson trade, which was phenomenal, you know? So, and he did yeah. pick up Geno Smith, which was a great pickup. So hard to find quarterbacks in the NFL. You found one like out of nothing, out of three. So, like, I got it. Like, at least he had some hits with his misses. Dave Gettleman had two total hits his whole entire career. One was at four overall, which is not even a hard place to hit. The other was 17 overall. Amazing hit. I mean, this dude had top 10 picks every year Had two guys to count for. I mean, maybe three if McKinney, you know, keeps it up. But it's just like, they, yeah, I don't think he can even be compared. He was just other level bad as a general manager, Dave Gettleman. Yeah, no, I, I was just saying it facetiously. And I know you're not comparing. I'm just looking for an excuse to 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 to, to take this out one more time. I'll take my anger out one more time. One more time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one last final time my yeah. ass yeah right yeah right all right i guess we'll wait to talk about the veto on the film review podcast if you want to hear our our comments and our reaction to brian dable's interesting comments about veto come listen to our film review it's a fun review i know it's a rough season but it's a fun review i guarantee it go watch last week's it was fun tommy devito dude he's a gunslinger mentality type quarterback and that makes the film a lot more fun to watch yeah there. I will say this, Nick, and we're about to get into it. And I have like four examples in my notes. There were some major processing issues in this game, dude. He just missed open receivers a lot and turned them into sacks. But at least he fires downfield with no regard, which I just freaking love. He has, I think he had, I want to say like five or six misses. Some of them weren't necessarily on him, weren't in the progression, more breakdowns Mm -hmm. in coverage because the Giants, and we'll get into this, the Giants use so much pre-snap motion in this game. Wandell Robinson was in jet motion like the entire game, and it screwed with what the Patriots were doing defensively. It led to a couple blown coverage opportunities. The Giants just couldn't seize. But one the Giants went to belly that could have been the, a big one. Yeah, against the that was the cover three. I love I love running Wandell Robinson on the jet motion and then just flaring him out towards the sideline, expand the curl flat, clear out the deep third. Nobody's taking the seam. What's going on? Ah, oh, it's excellent. Yeah. So there were a few of those. We'll get to that all. But yeah, anyway, thanks for listening. This was our reaction and takeaways from Joe Shane's presser. Keep it locked and loaded in Big Blue Banter. You will find our offensive film breakdown and our defensive film breakdown later. Have a good night.